Marvell, thank you so much for uh, being on Triloquy here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. You know, it's something how, um, you know, the world works and life works. I, I can remember back to um, freshman year, just somehow just finding that group of, uh, of black gays, um, you know, where we just hang out in the uh, in somebody's dorm room and, and, and talk shit about these men. And, right. and you were among them. So it's great for that to come <laughs> come around full circle to, uh, to, to get to uh, commune with you here. Right. I appreciate that. I, I do remember those days. And I also appreciate how many of us have grown and in our queerness, in our blackness, uh, some 15, almost 10 to 15 years later to see how we have grown and um, being advocates in our respective spaces. Yeah. And, you know, exploring um, that queerness and that blackness is something that you've had uh, the, the opportunity to dedicate your career to. And we're definitely going to um, get into that in honor of uh, this Pride Month. But I did want to um, start out with a conversation of music. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, being being from, uh, you don't live in Memphis now, but being from Memphis, you know, a very uh, musical city. Right. Uh, I'm sure you have some sort of a deep relationship with just music in, in general. What, what is that? What, what are some of the, the first sorts of musics you remember really being engaged by? Right. I think, um, one, I'm a church boy. And so I think part of that fabric of who I am, uh, re residing in Memphis, growing up in Memphis, definitely was around church, around gospel music, around uh, uh, going to, remember, I remember when the Church of God in Christ had the annual convention in Memphis, going to some of the midnight musicals at Mason Temple mm -hmm. and getting all of the friends together from the University of Memphis, uh, going to some of that and staying till 5 a.m. in the morning and then going to Waffle House. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> also growing up in a city where B.B. King uh, was 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 part of the history, the Stax Museum, Stax mm -hmm. Records. Uh, some of our uh, ancestors recorded in that space, but also the city where Elvis Presley has this mansion in Whitehaven, but also to talk about some of the history and how he also looted some of Black folks' music. And so- yeah, more than some of it, I'll say. Right, more than some <laughs> of it. And so how, as, as a Black kid growing in the city, we never took a field trip to Elvis Presley's home, uh, but we, we learned about Black artists and Black art in the city. And so really more so kind of that, that church background, but also as I grew up learning about around the Lamont Owen area, around what Black folks' contribution was yeah. to music in this country. Yeah, and for folks who don't know, Lemoyne Owen is a, a historically black college uh, down there in Memphis. Uh, you know, when, when you mentioned, uh, you know, coming up through the church and, and engaging music in that way, like so many of us did, I wonder if um, uh, that queerness, you know, the, the discovery of yourself and, and who you are um, ever uh, was at odds with that upbringing, if you had that perspective at all. I think at some point in my life, I, I did not grow up in a church where uh, anti-gay sermons were preached. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that and also recognize that moving in, a, in, a, in and out of spaces where black and brown queer people have been hurt by the church. Right. Um, I didn't grow up under that experience, but I know so many people have this relationship with the church. I did struggle with my queerness, being gay, and also uh, loving the church. I often tell people my activism and advocacy came from the Black church. Yeah. It, it, it taught me how to schedule meetings. It taught me how to get people on the phone. It taught me how to mobilize. It taught me how to count money, money in Sunday school. Uh, but it also taught me that Black folks to get to a meeting mean to food. Yeah. And I learned that, but also on the flip side of that, my wholeness as this person that loved guys and had this same sex attraction and the reconciliation, uh, I'll be 35 this year. I think it takes a lifelong journey almost uh, to reprogram yourself uh, or, and, to, and to tell yourself that all of those identities that you have can exist in one person and you can work and serve in church and have all those identities show up. 
Absolutely. You know, I, I was, I'll say that, you know, I was one of those um, people who was hurt by the black church growing up. You know, I didn't have that positive experience, but, you know, growing up and understanding uh, uh, specifically the spe- uh, the uh, history of the spiritual and how that has a place in the black church and how that had a place, you know, in our first um, a- alleged freedom, um, right. you know, and, and, and the spreading of, of messages in that way. That's always why I have uh, considered the spiritual America's original um, classical music, you know, something that your partner Adrian um, also right. affirms in his work. Yeah. Um, but that definition of classical music um, is, is still sort of fringe for a lot of people. I, mm-hmm. I wonder um, what is your relationship with the idea of, of so-called classical music and, and how you've defined that over the years for yourself? Sure, sure. You mentioned uh, my partner, Adrian Dunn, who uh, has a project out around repurposing uh, the spirituals for lives of Black men. But to be honest, my introduction, that was my introduction to classical music within the last year and a half. Uh, As a a kid coming up through Memphis, uh, economics, I believe, played a role into getting classical music to Black and Brown kids in that city. Uh, Having, you know, I went elementary, middle school, and high school, that was not one time that I've experienced classical music in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding, we do have a, uh, there's an opera house, there's a classical music, there's an orchestra in Memphis that I've never had an opportunity. Uh, While they had concerts on the Mississippi River, I remember the commercials, I remember the advertisement, but as a young kid growing up in that city, never having the opportunity to experience classical music. Let me tell you my first experience in classical music Please. right, was going to Temple Deliverance, Church of God in Christ, Bountiful Blessings, G. Patterson, and I saw a full orchestra playing uh, in the pit before the, um, be- before the full choir. Mm-hmm. I was amazed. You know, meeting some of my friends at the University of Memphis uh, who said that they played in the orchestra at the Temple Deliverance Church of God in Christ. And so seeing this 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 full circle moment as we talk about spirituals, uh, as we talk about classical music and as we talk about my background of the church for this actual moment that there is preaching there is a choir black folks music pentecostal music folks falling out and you got a big harp right here <laughs> <laughs> hey man <laughs> and, and, and so i my experience with classical music has always up until this point in my life has been something that is very foreign to me uh, i felt uh, classical music was very white to be very honest sure, yeah uh, and i felt cla- that was nothing that resonated with me as far as as the music, uh, the lyrics, the language, um, I did not see how that resonated with me in my life. Uh, at this point, the way that I define classical music is Western uh, European approach to, to something that they stole from us mm. uh, as Black folks. Uh, and so as we talk about looting again, I think it is the music uh, that white folks stole from Black music and tried to make it their own. And so my experience now with classical music, I've, I've had an opportunity to meet amazing Black classical artists, uh, to meet amazing Black opera singers. Never in my life did I have an opportunity. Yeah, Marian Anderson, Leotine Price. Right. I think we learn about those historic figureheads, but it almost seems that there are only five people that we can name, and there's a whole cluster Uh, and whole spectrum of Black artists that reside in the classical space. And so how do we look at challenging opera houses to ensure that they teach Black and Brown kids, that they um, diversify their funding efforts to ensure that young kids living in urban communities or major metropolitan cities, that that music gets to them as well? Right. And, you know, uh, something that everyone is, uh, a lot of people anyway, are starting to explore uh, within the uh, category of so-called classical music is uh, protest and and how music can can drive protest. And I know that uh, protest music is something that uh, you have uh, had an interest in outside of of the the, the classical lens. I I know you gave uh, Wale's new project a shout out on your uh, your social media. I wonder, you know, and as we transition here into uh, specifically into the work you do, 
I wonder if uh, protest music, uh, classical or otherwise, has um, had a role in your, your career and, and, and the way you view AIDS and HIV prevention. I think, I think music, protest music, I, I definitely, yes, has had a role in the way I inform my protest or my activism. Um, thinking about the early days of the HIV and AIDS movement, yeah. uh, but, but, but even more so that I have to go back to the civil rights movement and the freedom songs. Mm. And when we protest, we did chants. Um, people were singing. When you look at the March on Washington and how Harry Belafonte was present and some of the um, uh, Mary Anderson, some of those artists were very much present during their time and how what what art and music means to movements. Mm -hmm. So now we have this LGBT movement and how during the ACT UP era during, on Broadway, many of the singers and listening to uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Holliday talk about dream girls. Yeah. And how many of the dancers, many of the actors in dream girls died over, over the weekend or over a course of period of time uh, and how music played a critical role in that. And so the way that it inform, informs my activism is hosting rallies, ho hosting protests. There's important, it is important to have artists present. Yeah. Uh, I think protest music ignites us. It informs our activism. Uh, it encourages, encourages us along the way. Uh, I think music is this critical thing. It is the soundtrack to our lives. Uh, when I listen to music or when I am trying to prepare something as it relates to policy around HIV and AIDS or issues around LGBTQ, I think those are the moments that we often go to music. And we go to, you know, Wale is one person that I highlighted, but Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, shout know. out to him. <laughs> right, shout out to him. Pulitzer Prize winning composer. Right. <laughs> composer Kendrick Lamar, you know, yeah. the pimple butterfly. You think about Solange, a seat at the table. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a black trans woman, Shay Diamond, has a song called American Pie uh, that talks about the plight of, of black trans women. I think all of those... Um, that music speaks to what I do on a daily basis, looking at young activist groups such as BYP 100, you know, mm. that is based in Chicago, but looking at a guy named Jonathan Likes, who uh, is kind of this social activist who uses music at the protest. And I think music for me has informed it in a way uh, that puts uh, words on paper uh, and that is very encouraging before the actual activism. And I think when we get to the actual activism as a black queer person, uh, I love music. Uh, yeah. and, and I think it is a way to mobilize my peers. Absolutely. And, you know, with this being a uh, black music appreciation month, you know, that's a, a conversation that's been uh, highlighted even more. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it is also uh, pride month. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sure this is a very busy time of the year for you. Yes. Uh, uh, talk to me a little bit um, about, um, you know, your work, what your job is, and why it's important um, for you to do your job, again, from that Black perspective. I, I think folks try to um, bring in uh, the, uh, the, the, the queer community as a whole into some of these conversations, but just like every other aspect of the world, Black folks have unique challenges. Right, right. Yeah, so my, my work around HIV, uh, ensuring that Black voices are in LGBT spaces, uh, kind of all of that, that work that I've done probably over the last 10 years, actually started uh, being diagnosed with HIV in Memphis. Um, while being a student at the University of Memphis, uh, getting sick, uh, never really hearing about HIV really in, in the education system, hearing about STDs uh, from a heterosexual perspective. But of course, there's no school teaching around uh, gay men having sex or what is the there's no right way, but what is a, um, what is a very uh, safe way uh, to have sex? What is a very um, a, a consensual way to have sex between two guys or those same-sex relationships. And so my first experience 
of doing this work is one, my own diagnosis, going down to the county health department, um, getting my test results, uh, and then being informed that I have a CD4 count of two. And for many of many of the listeners, to put that in context, a CD4 uh, measures kind of your immune system. And for me, uh, the lowest I one can get is a zero. And so I was at a two. Oh, wow. And so I was very sick at that time. Uh, and I remember the social worker who talked to me with her back turned towards me and told me, do you know what that really means? And I said, no. And she said, you should be dead right now. Uh, because your CD4 is so low. And so for me, that began my day of activism. And it also began the day that I um, very early on did this dance of linking into care, uh, HIV care, staying adherent to medications. I did that dance for about two or three years because of stigma, mm. because I felt uh, how could this be me? You know, how could this happen to me? Uh, after that, I opened up an organization called the Red Door Foundation uh, that I started in Memphis, uh, which was to provide services for Black gay men, uh, because there was not an organization ran by a Black gay man. If we are to be uh, one of the highest statistics in the community, why aren't we in leadership roles in our communities? You know, something mm -hmm. uh, that I, I saw a need for. And so I started an organization uh, because one, Black folks were not leading organizations as it relates to HIV and AIDS. And then I started a convening that lasted eight years called Saving Ourselves Symposium. I called it SOS uh, for Black LGBTQ people. And we moved it across the South uh, being located in Memphis, we had it in Jackson, South Carolina, Birmingham, because we wanted to move it to locations where uh, normally national conferences do not go to smaller cities because of the heavy burden of finances. But I wanted to ensure that we mobilize folks in areas that have high HIV rates. And when you look at those cities, those are metropolitan cities in the South. That's mm -hmm. Memphis, that's Jackson, Mississippi, that's New Orleans, that's Charleston, that's, that's my Miami, Florida, Orlando, Florida. Yeah, Atlanta, are, yeah. Atlanta. How can I forget Atlanta? These are cities where Black folks live. These are cities where uh, Black folks reside. But we also look at these. These are cities where have high rates of COVID-19. Right. It's the complexities of, of health disparities, of HIV, of heart, dis heart disease, hypertension, now layered with this issue of, of COVID-19. And so that is kind of how I arrived uh, doing HIV work, it is both personal for me and as well as professional uh, for me. I also created uh, a consulting group to uh, inform institutions on how to communicate to black and brown queer folks as far as their languaging, as mm -hmm. far as their promotions, as far as their advertising. Uh, and I'll also full time do uh, grant making uh, through an organization in Washington, D.C. called Age United, where I'm mad where I manage a Southern fund for organizations where we give money to, to continue to do that HIV work. Yeah. And, you know, when you hit on uh, the education piece, you know, th that, that's what I always go back to because, you know, for, 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 for lack of a better phrase, you know, uh, gay men, specifically black gay men of our generation, we had to learn about our sexuality on the streets for, yes. you know, for, for, for lack of a better phrase, you know, we didn't have, I won't speak for all of us, but, you know, I certainly didn't have parents that could speak to what it meant to engage sexually with, right. with other men and, and neither did the, uh, you know, needed neither did the education systems. Right. Um, I, I, so, with that in mind, um, I'm wondering uh, if you could just lay out some of that uh, language that folks do not know. You've already talked about um, CD4. Um, what what about uh, these acronyms AIDS, HIV? What 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 is that? Because I, I I think sometimes we take for granted that a lot of folks don't understand the difference between those two words, those two phrases. Right. Um, so language is very important in our country, in our context, in our community. You know, I believe uh, that Black gay folks, uh, Black queer folks, uh, make up a very interesting uh, language, and we can talk to one another in a very interesting way. Uh, but even more so when it comes to our education, I think many of us learned about sex through pornography, you know, watching porn. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, for some of us, we've not, we, we did not see, you know, safer sex practices through those, 
through porn. And so we didn't see the guy put on the condom if he used a condom. And you know that I, I in this moment, state that, you know, as people choices to use condoms, there are many ways of uh, protecting oneself. You have condoms, you have pre-exposure prophylaxis, which stands for PrEP, which is a pill a day that you take. And so recognizing that there are multiple ways in 2020 that people can protect themselves. Mm -hmm. But in the early 2000s, you're talking about a young gay kid who was looking at porn, learning how to be a top or learning how to be a bottom and not seeing the bottom squeeze up or tighten up. I was like, I, this hurts a little bit to right. me. What do I, what do I, what type of lube do I supposed yeah. to use? Water-based or silicone? What, what is, what is, what is best for me? And so a lot of that for us has been trial and error where we have had to educate ourselves. And let's not talk about the stigma of telling our peers that we are living with HIV. And so when we right. talk about language, you know, to, to say someone is HIV positive opposed to living with HIV, it speaks to the whole person. It speaks to the totality of the person. We often don't say someone is diagnosed diabetes positive or right. someone is cancer positive, they're living with cancer. They are living with HIV. And so it speaks to their resilience. It, it, it speaks to them thriving. Uh, the difference we often say in the community that they have full blown AIDS, that is not possible mm. uh, because there's no half AIDS, sure. you know what I mean? And so uh, either the person has HIV or has AIDS. And so uh, HIV can be diagnosed through a test, through an oral swab, or through a blood test, but a, a, a provider, a medical provider has to diagnose someone with AIDS. And so AIDS is the progression of HIV. And so you, so we can't, you can't, you know, get tested for AIDS, quote unquote, at the club or, mm -hmm. you know, sidewalk testing or festival testing. What they are testing you for is HIV. It is a medical provider based on your viral load and based on your CD4 and based on any other opportunistic infections, does a medical provider diagnose someone with AIDS? And so it's, it's been this, this relationship that we often see wording as HIV slash AIDS. And I think that often confuses a lot of people to say those words are interchangeable. And what I've tried to do in a format uh, is do HIV and AIDS or HIV or AIDS in my writing format and the way that I use language and community. You know, uh, Anthony Fauci, the Dr. Anthony Fauci is a name everyone knows today uh, because of right. coronavirus, but I understand uh, he actually has a legacy in the sort of work that you do. Yes. I have been familiar with Anthony Fauci, I think. Uh, so one of the larger conferences for people doing HIV work is called the Internet. The one, there's an international conference on AIDS, uh, and then there's a United States conference on AIDS. And so, I, and I, I also want to reference that a lot of institutions who were started in the 80s and early 90s still use the word AIDS. Mm. And so, you know, as we talk about language justice and as we talk about change in language, we also have to recognize that a lot of historical institutions use uh, antiquated language. You know, look at the NAACP, the National Council for Negro People, you know, mm. National Advancement Fund. So it's a lot of institutions that use a lot of uh, outdated language. But my first introduction to Dr. Fauci was at a conference, was at a United States conference on AIDS. Uh, and he took the podium uh, and he is such a giant in our community uh, because he uh, is one of the first people uh, that put a name to it. Uh, one of the first people that stood up to the Ronald Reagan administration uh, and challenged them uh, and really went to the NIH, uh, put a name to this uh, and began to create methods of treatment and this treatment model for the community. And so uh, before the world uh, kind of knew about Anthony Fauci as it relates to COVID-19, uh, when I saw him approach the platform at the White House, I could say I know him yeah. uh, because he uh, has been a part of the salvation for so many of us who are living with HIV, uh, but I, not only us living with HIV, but I think he's been part of the salvation uh, to prevent uh, people from being diagnosed with HIV in this country. Yeah, there's a lot of um, talk 
uh, you know, uh, politicizing um, when it comes to what we're all living with right now, you know, the coronavirus, we're all living with it in a way. I, I wonder if um, you're, um, you're being familiar with uh, Dr. Fauci, the work you do. I, I wonder if it's informed an opinion of yours when it comes to uh, coronavirus uh, prevention and, and response. I mean, all the way down to wearing that mask, unfortunately, has, has become a, a politicized thing. I mean, does your experience in HIV and AIDS uh, pr provide you uh, a leg up, if you will, when it comes to coronavirus? I think so. I think the I think COVID nineteen um, is is viewed as something that can be passed through um, multiple forms of you know. There's much speculation through saliva, through kissing, through all of those forms, which mm -hmm. was very early on in the days of HIV. People uh, did not know how one could get HIV, uh, similar to COVID. There, it is shifting every single day. You know, um, articles are saying many different things of how one uh, could get get coronavirus and what does it look like once it's in your body right and so for me being um, in spaces of infectious disease um, I was very familiar with the route that they were going you know using protection which is the mask you know in my community it's a condom or right. it's a prep or it is you know many methods that people use for protection it is uh having to go get tested i got tested for COVID last week one i wanted to experience that uh as a person who is in community who is about informing people through the multiple platforms that i use i wanted to see how the tests went how to go get the test what 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 systems and what structures do we have to go through to get a test as a person that knows the healthcare system System very well because of having to get into the healthcare system uh, getting I wanted to know what was it like to get a COVID test how many times do you have to call the same person over and over to get your results for a test I wanted to know that experience and so that experience going in uh, to the doctor uh, kind of I didn't I was I did not live with HIV in the 80s and the 90s of course but it I, I could see what those people probably went through Mm -hmm. the, the medical provider was fully gloved that she had a mask on she had a hair you know she had her hair protected she had multiple layers of protective gear on mm -hmm. that remind that that as a person living with hiv that is often viewed as an infection or something that someone else can get in that moment reminded me of what people had to go through uh, when people were unsure how hiv was passed from one person to another and so i think this experience uh, has taught me a lot, but I also think that I came into this experience the, the, talking about the coronavirus definitely with a little bit more knowledge uh, than an average American. Sure. And, uh, you know, w when it comes to, um, you know, folks like Dr. Fauci and, and others, you know, Black, uh, queer uh, men and women and, and, and those who uh, identify uh, otherwise, you know, we, we, we've had some of those non-Black allies, but, you know, it, it's, it's a question that comes to me uh, every day from non-Black people. Well, how can I help? How can I be an ally? So I, I'd like to throw that question to you, you know, to the non-Black person asking how they can be an ally specifically to Black queer people as it relates to AIDS and HIV. What, what would you tell them? I think there are multiple things uh, to tell them. The first thing I could uh, do to tell them is one, educate yourself. Yeah. Um, I think we often want to be allies in various spaces and various industries without spending the time to educate ourselves about that industry, about that issue that we want to uh, be an ally about. And so the first thing I say, educate yourself. The second thing I say, find something in your local community, whether it is that community-based organization what it, whether it is that aid servicing organization, uh, ASO or CBO, community-based organization, uh, find ways, how can, how can I volunteer? How can I uh, show up and be present? Um, how can I donate my dollars, you know, uh, to our small organizations? And so uh, similar to the music space, we have, you all have the historical 
uh, houses that get funded or mm -hmm. institutions. Similar to HIV space, uh, the money from the government and from the CDC often go to the larger organizations that hire white people to write grants. Right. While, while you have smaller grassroots organizations created by black trans women and black gay men that struggle to get the funding because they don't have the money to hire the grant writers to make their grant look like something that they're not really doing. And so seek out a small organization that, in you, that is in your community. I will preference it with a person of color, with, with a black trans woman, with a black gay man. The Latinx community also needs support. And so how do we, how do we show up and try to fund those initiatives that they're doing or try to make many MINI grants within your community if you have those resources? And then the, the last thing that I will say, speak out when you see injustice. And so when we talk about Black Lives Matter, that also means in the health system as well. Yeah. Recognizing that uh, Black folks don't often get access to care like our counterparts. Uh, data suggests that Black gay men don't have more sex than our racial counterparts. It is about access to health care. It is about our geography. It is about our, our social networks. And so it's not because we have more. There are other issues that impact our community. When I do training with clinics, I'll often say, who wants to come into a clinic with white walls, white doctors, and white floors? Mm. And white coats. I, and white coats. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is reflected in this institution that represents me. Where is your black art or art that speaks to my experience? Where are the quotes by James Baldwin and Bayard Rustin? Where, where's your, where, where are the people behind the front desk that looks like me? Where are the, the workers? Where are the black doctors? We know they exist that look like me and that can speak to my cultural experiences. It's one thing to attack the disease, but it's another thing to speak to my culture, to, to understand stigma, to understand why people do the things that they do once they get to the provider. And so I feel that those are the things that I can tell someone that who wants to be an ally. And then, and then finally, I will, I, will, I will also add, people often say they don't know no one with HIV and I, I will push back on that. Yeah. I don't think we often make spaces comfortable for people to share their lived experience and for people to disclose to people, I am a person living with HIV. I remember early on, how painful it was to go to the doctor every three months, uh, how painful it was uh, to take medication. Uh, one, of the, one of the very first uh, three-in-one pills was called a tripla. And when I got diagnosed, that was the pill that I was on and how it made you kind of uh, float mm -hmm. and sick during the daytime. It is support like that, uh, that, that one needs to kind of get through the process. Yeah. Uh, before I give you the opportunity to uh, plug all your things and let people know how they can find you, uh, I want you to address the shirt you're wearing. And for the folks uh, only listening, it says, I am my ancestor's wildest dreams. In what way do you see yourself as your ancestor's wildest dreams? I believe Maya Angelou said, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. Um, I don't know where my ancestors thought that I would be at this point, but I, I, I believe that I have gone beyond what they think that I will become. And so when I say I, that is a, a Black person, a Black person living with HIV, a Black queer person, a Black person of the church, the, multi the multiple identities that I bring to this space, I don't, I, I look at the protest across the country and demonstrations and I, and I, and I called my grandmother the other day who marched in 1968 after Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis. And I asked her how that experience was. Uh, and she marched and she said, I struggled to keep up with the crowd, but I marched. And her response to me was, I want you to be safe. And I told her, you did it. Now you don't have to do it, you cheer us on. And so I believe that I am her wildest dream, that I am the wildest dream of my great grandmother, Elizabeth Hyman. I don't know if they thought that we would go this far. I believe, yes, they knew what they were fighting for in the present moment, but to see us back in the streets again, 
Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer said that young people, if they don't have it, you're not going to have it and we all going to tear it up. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so she said that in an interview again in 1968, after Dr. King was assassinated, that if young people don't have it, you ain't going to have it and the young people going to tear it up. We are in 2020. And so I don't know if our ancestors, both black and queer, both black, both black and female, knew how far we were going to go. But I am uh, bold enough to believe that as we move in this space, we have an army of a thousand behind us fighting for us and rooting us on. And so um, when, I, when I wear this shirt, uh, it is a moment for me to reflect on what our ancestors fought for. Uh, and it is a moment that that dream that they had, that Dr. King had, I am the wildest dream. I've gone beyond that initial dream that they wanted. Amen. Amen. How could folks uh, reach out to you, uh, uh, learn more about the work you do and uh, contribute to the work that you're doing? Sure. Uh, Marvel Terry uh, on all social media platforms. Uh, we are redoing my website because I'm getting ready to launch a book around mobilizing and, and protesting. Uh, and so one of the ways that uh, people can uh, donate is through Cash App, you know, Cash uh, Dollar Sign Marvel Terry is one way uh, as I, in my own way, support Black artists. Uh, one of which is my partner. And so adriandunn.com is another way that by him you can find me uh, because I think we move as one, uh, that I try to find ways to support Black artists. And so, of course, Marvel Terry on all platforms. Uh, there's a Black Music Matters t-shirt found on my partner's website that I ask that people support. And by essence, by support and buying that t-shirt, you're supporting me as well. Marvel, it's been marvelous to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on Triloquy. Thank you so much for having me.